FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and it's 9 19, 19 which is a palindrome. If you don't know what that is, just Google it. Basically, I don't know what it means. I am not sure it means anything. I should have asked uh, our astrological financial analyst. If there's a numerological financial analyst out there, please email me. I've never interviewed one of you before. I don't even know if you exist, but if you do, please make your presence known and email me kl at com. Well, hey, right now, gold's retraced a bit. Uh, it's trading right at fourteen ninety nine and change. It's up five five dollars and forty cents for the day. Silver up nine cents, uh, trading just below eighteen dollars at seventeen eighty two. But that can change very quickly, just like the economy can. Uh, yesterday on the eighteenth, we saw a twenty five basis point cut of the federal funds rate. Well, let's find out what that means. We've got our good friend on with us now. Jim Welsh. Jim, it's always great to have you on. So, hey, we're looking at this. Employment number is still not terrible. Uh, you know, the indicators aren't awful, but they're not great. They're kind of a little murky to neutral right now, right? Um, I would say, actually, they're maybe a little bit better than that, uh, Kerry, in the sense that GDP is growing around 2% or so. The Fed's long-term uh, non-inflationary growth estimate is like 1.8%. So the economy has obviously slowed, but it's still growing above its growth potential. Um, you noted the unemployment rate is still hovering, you know, 50-year lows, wage growth 3.2%. Those are decent numbers. Um, the other thing I would mention is, you know, the Fed has a 2% inflation target. Last week, the core producer price index came in at 2.3. The core consumer price index came in at 2.4. The Dallas trim mean inflation rate has been hovering since February at 2%. Now, the Fed, those aren't the Fed's preferred inflation metrics. They look at the core personal consumption expenditure in the index, the PCE, which is at 1.6%. But the point being is with all these other measures of inflation at or above 2%, the probability is we're going to see the core PCE move toward 2%. And Powell essentially and the Fed said that in their statement. So if you look at just the U.S. economy in isolation with 10-year bond yields as low as they are, housing's doing okay, um, you know, the bottom line is, does, a, does our economy in isolation need any more stimulus? And I think the answer clearly is no. Um, but we aren't in isolation, and globally we have a slowdown, and there are uncertainties, which is weighing on business investment, and obviously on trade. And over the last 50 years, uh, globalization and the increase in trade was one of the real big tailwinds for global growth. Um, and, but we're seeing that starting to, to wane a little bit. So again, I think what the Fed is doing is saying, you know what, there's some risk out there regarding the trade uncertainty, Brexit, and uh, you know we're going to cut rates to give the economy support before anything bad happens. And, you know, as I said, Powell, you know, said there's two ways we can go. We can either try to move ahead of maybe weaker news or we can act to cushion it. And this way, maybe we don't get behind the curve if things go off the rails. So, you know, I, I think that's the conundrum that the Fed has been facing within the Fed that is very obvious in terms of listening to what some of the Fed presidents have said. Um, but, you know, the Fed chose the course of saying we're going to ease just to buy a little bit more insurance. So we'll see how the trade thing turns out. Um, but I think that's the path they've chosen. Um, but as I said, if everything stays kind of where it is, six weeks from now, I would say they do not cut again well, at that meeting. And I think we're really at a point where it's one meeting at a time. Well, you know that uh, Greenspan always said uh, it was the Fed's <clears throat> job to take away the punch bowl when the uh, participants got a little too intoxicated if you will right and uh, maybe <laughs> well that that originated with a guy in the 1960s uh the fed chairman back there mckenzie Mars. Yes, so 
he was the first guy to use that. And of course, Greenspan was more than happy to, to uh, you know, relay those sentiments uh, as well. But we're in a different environment than the 1960s, obviously, a global economy. We're not insulated. The one thing that has helped us is manufacturing is about 11 percent of GDP uh, for the U.S. It's 22 percent in Germany, 30 percent uh, in China, a little bit above that. Mm-hmm. Also, trade only represents about 12 percent of GDP, whereas in Germany, it's like 47 percent. So, right. you know, what's happened here is Germany has slowed really markedly from 1.6% GDP to about 0.9. And so, you know, we are maybe instigating this trade war, but we're somewhat buffered based on the the composition of our economy. Jim, I would say, uh, if we were going to update that saying, I'd say the uh, job of the Fed is to take away the uh, keys to the Lamborghini from the teenagers when they get a little too tipsy. And uh, I think uh, I think it needs to be updated because we're way past yeah. uh, the uh, any semblance of reasonableness on the participants, whether it's whether it's the Congress in uh, how they allocate and and expend funds, or the president mm-hmm. uh, in uh, flexing military muscle, or the big banks and the uh, the speculators. You know, they're way, way over the top, way more, way more yeah. crazy than they used to be. Got a question for you, because I know you're a Fed watcher. What do you make of the recent Fed funds? Uh, I should say the repo market yeah. uh, meltdown. How important is that? Um, I think in the short term, I wouldn't uh, overemphasize it, uh, because I think there were a number of technical factors that came together. Um, and the Fed is moving to address it. Uh, I think the key, carry is that's the correct, uh, I think, assumption as long as it, that issue goes away. You know, in other words, if the Fed uh, does, um, and they used to do this all the time, where they would do a, a, a repo for a week, two weeks, where they would add liquidity. But going into the end of the, the quarter, uh, I think I would become more concerned if it happened again as we get past uh, September 30th. So in the short run, I think it's mostly technical in nature. I think the Fed is doing things to kind of add liquidity to calm things down. Um, but you know, I reserve judgment you know, for let's see what happens as we get past September 30th. And if it starts to crop up uh, again, then I think you have to pay a little bit more attention. The, the other point I would make is you know people drew comparison. Oh my God, this could be Lehman all over again. Well, the difference is there are a lot of differences, but if we look at how the bond market responded, it yawned. Uh, we look at spreads between credit, uh, corporate bonds and treasuries, they haven't moved at all. So that's, those are other, if you will care, uh, uh, was it canaries in the coal mine type of thing. So when you see the overall bond market and credit market acting, okay, I think that's another sign that, all right, this was some more technical anomaly sign of any real problem. Yeah. We just go back to, to 2008 when uh, the collateral became worthless, when all those triple A rated mortgage backed securities became worth nothing. And I wonder, and you know that we haven't learned anything since then because we're still playing the same games. Repos are really a benchmark fundamental aspect of Fed policy and uh, bank cash management in the ever never ending search to uh, extract a few more basis points in yield when you're dealing with trillions of dollars that comes out to billions. Uh, you yeah. know, these uh, banks will go way overboard. It's how MF, MFS Global kind of vaporized in thin air, hyper hypothecation. Right. So nobody knows really who owns these repos, these securities. To me, what I'm looking at is there's a bank here that is holding these things or was supposedly holding the securities and can't make good on it. And I don't know who it is, but I don't just, this is a, you know, Jim, this is really fundamental to the financial system. If it's malfunctioning in some way, and I don't buy technical because it went over the course of two days. And these are often repos are often overnight so we, we should be right, we should explain right. to you out there what a repo is. So a bank holding AAA rated securities, whether it's a corporate bond from Apple 
or U.S. government debt will sell that to another entity, and then uh, the bank or other financial institution sells it, they get cash, they get a certain interest rate, and or they pay a certain interest rate, and then the other bank agrees that they will sell it back to this entity at a certain point in time, and everything is good. But, you know, the problem here is that if this all depends on faith and trust, I think there's a bank out there, we don't know their name, we don't know who it is, but uh, or other financial entity, because hedge funds could be doing these too, is in trouble and don't have the securities to give back or don't have the money to repurchase the securities. And that is what has screwed up this market. But we don't have any transparency in this market, so we don't know. It could be right. a portent of, uh, of a cascading uh, series of defaults or a financial lockup. I'm not saying it is. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I'm just yeah, saying, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying here? Because, yeah, no, I mean, I think the point you're bringing up, and if we look at some of the volatility that's taken place in the treasury market earlier this week in the oil market, and that there could be uh, the hedge funds, particularly that were <laughs> positioned wrongly, you know, in terms, I mean, the, the 10 year and 30 year jumped over 40 basis points in about six trading days. Mm -hmm. That's somewhat historic. So to be on the wrong side of that trade, it'd be a lot of pain. And we saw what happened with oil uh, between Monday and Tuesday. So is there the potential that somebody uh, is, you know, uh, got hurt in all that? Um, yeah, I think that is the case. Um, from a systemic standpoint, though, I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed uh, in August of 2007 was that the, the Treasury bill rate, dropped in about a week and a half from over 5% down to about 2.5%. And, and at the time, I wrote Unheard of. that Unheard this of. represented like an earthquake or a tsunami going through the financial system for that kind of a move to take place without any Fed action whatsoever. So I think we need to see other signs that, all right, there really is potential uh, a problem. But again, the, the banks truly are way more capitalized than they were in 2007 and eight. U.S. Uh, US leverage banks. ratios were 30 to one. I think mm -hmm. they're closer to 12 to one at this point in time. So the U.S. banking system really is in a much, much stronger, more stable place, uh, certainly than the European <laughs> banking well, system. I would just so, say, um, I would just say to that, you know, Jim, I would just say we hope because, you know, there's all these off balance sheet tricks that they play, single purpose vehicles, mm -hmm. SPVs all these things that they creative ways they think of to lose money and they're masters at it because uh, banking, banking crises, there's nothing new about that. We've had them throughout, right. throughout the history of the U S uh, the United States and the uh, modern financial system. So, Hey, yep. why, why isn't gold, you know, then we had the attack, uh, the so-called Iranian attack upon Saudi oil installations Originally, they said half of Saudi Arabia's oil output would be uh, basically shut down for months. And now it's like, hey, no big deal. We'll have it up and running in two days. It's like almost like, you know, if you were a speculator and you were betting the right side of that trade, man, you could have cleaned up mm -hmm. and just gotten out uh, in two days, probably doubled or tripled your, your money with all the leverage, maybe, maybe even more than that. Uh, it sounds like almost a setup, doesn't it? FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Today's show is brought to you by U.S. Gold Corp. U.S. Gold Corp. is a U.S.-focused gold exploration and development company advancing high-potential projects in Wyoming and Nevada. U.S. Gold Corp. has consolidated a district on Nevada's productive cortex trend and is advancing the Copper King project towards production in Wyoming. Led by a team of prolific company builders and renowned explorers, including Dave Mathewson, who is directly responsible for several major Nevada gold discoveries. U.S. Gold Corp. is well capitalized and has an extremely tight share structure with less than twenty million million shares outstanding and trades on the NASDAQ, a major exchange under the ticker symbol USAU. To learn more, go to usgoldcorp.gold. That's usgoldcorp.gold. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Well, I mean, again, to um, I think it was an act of war. Um, and I'm not sure 
um, anyone would have allowed it to happen. Um, so I, I think, you know, if you knew about it ahead of time, they would not have allowed it yeah. to happen. <laughs> I'm At not blaming time, you. I don't want to be conspiracy uh, theory. It just yeah, so convenient. Yeah. Maybe well, the at attack. the same time, I think yeah. look at it from Saudi's perspective. You mm-hmm. know, do they look better by saying, you know, it may take us a few weeks yeah. uh, to get this up and running, and then they come in well shorter than that time frame. It oh, makes sure. them look like okay, they they really handled it well, as opposed to okay, don't worry, uh, this is only going to last for twenty four hours, <clears throat> and it wound up, and if it wound up taking two or three weeks, then they looked incompetent. Yeah. So. I mean, I think to some extent, the idea that it was going to take longer was actually whether the Saudis, you know, put that out there, knowing that they were going to be able to get things back on track more quickly, just so that it would make them look good. But, Mm -hmm. you know, the reality is here, they have Patriot missile systems that they bought. I think they have six of them for a, a billion dollars a piece that whoever, you know, conducted this operation were able to evade those yes. Patriot missile systems. Mm-hmm. So clearly, uh, you know, that you know, shows that there's a very significant vulnerability to protect those assets. Yeah. And, you know, that, that I think is a message that is, you know, that was part of the whole thing. It's like, okay, you want to keep squeezing us? This is what we can do. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, we've seen the last or the end of this whole episode. But I think that was a very significant event, and um, we'll see how Saudi chooses to respond, and obviously the U.S. is going to back Saudi, so we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's just interesting the way it shook out, because it uh, yeah. turned out to be a blip. Yeah. It sounded like really major, and the markets treated it that way on Monday, and then by Tuesday, you know, two days ago, everything is back to normal. Right. Situation. Uh, yeah. I don't want to use the, uh, <laughs> the old uh, thing. Uh, snafu. You know what that means. Situation normal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> or it was, it just. Fubar. Yeah, Fubar, all that good <laughs> stuff. And, you know, basically they got caught flat footed. I'm sure there's reasons yeah. why that attack happened. Uh, and it could represent escalation, but so far. Nothing's going on. Trump wisely, in my opinion, refraining from uh, any anything. But at some point, the Iranians are going to push this too far. And then we're going to see uh, hallelujah time. I don't know what's going to yeah. happen, but it's not going to be pretty. And it's not going to be good for the world economy. So that leads us to gold. So gold, it's flagging right under that $1,500 mark. Apparently consolidating, mm-hmm. you and I would think. What's ahead for gold and silver um my take is that um you know i look at positioning uh, every week from the commitment to traders report and the trend followers maybe large speculators uh hedge funds uh, managed accounts would be the ctas they're trend followers and they had the long the largest long position uh, since july of 2016 uh, a few weeks ago uh commercials are on the other side of that. And producers typically look at big rallies as an opportunity to hedge. So my belief was that gold was nearing a high as it got near 1550. And um, the decline from 1556 down to 1485 was about a $71 to drop. But the positioning didn't really change uh, much uh, last week, Terry. So to me, what that implies is the bullish sentiment is still you know, very rampant. Uh, a lot of people looking at that as just a pullback um, and an opportunity to buy, which is you know pretty normal when there's excessive bullishness. It doesn't evaporate overnight. Um, so my take is that I think gold is going to drop to 1450 or so as just two equal legs down. It drops from 1556, 1485, bounced to 1521. You subtract 71 bucks, you get down around 1450. The move from 1266 to 1556, a 50% retracement is 1411. So I think there's the potential that gold will drop to at least 1450 and maybe down towards closer to 1400 um, before there's another you know decent size bounce. Um, I think it's going to take a while to wear off some of the bullishness and unwind 
some of the trend following positions. And if, you know, typically what happens is <clears throat> you take out 1500 convincingly that all the people who jumped on board above 1500, you know, they start to feel the heat and that, and, you know, they turn into sellers. And I think that's where the positioning can be very helpful in understanding why markets move the way they do when it doesn't make sense sometimes. Um, so that's my outlook. I think both metals are going to have a pullback over the next few weeks. And, um, and then, you know, if indeed gold gets down towards 15, or pardon me, 1450 or so, then, you know, it's like, all right, let's take a look and see how things look at that point in time, whether or not gold can mount another rally. So, you know, I'm longer term still bullish. I think uh, gold is going to move higher longer term. I just think that this pullback has the potential of being a little deeper, lasting a little longer just to, you know, get things uh, you know, reset, if you will, from a positioning and sentiment standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree with you. So consolidation, and then we're approaching the seasonal, uh, usually seasonal strong fourth quarter, um, where gold usually about a week or two after December, after there's been the Canadian tax loss selling mm-hmm. generally picks up. It did last year. It has uh, I think it's up to about 75, 80% chance that it's going to happen. It's not to say that it must happen, but certainly right. it went up so far so fast in the seasonally weakest part of the year that the market would really have to be behaving uh, in a peculiar fashion for it not to go up in this fourth quarter. Yeah. Um, again, I, all I'm looking, looking at it is in terms of, okay, over the next handful of weeks, What's going to happen? My take is that I think gold pulls back towards 1450. Um, and then that may set up uh, a move up in the fourth quarter, um, you know, before starting before the end of the year. I mean, the last number of years in 2015, gold made a significant low in December. 2016, significant low in December. Uh, last year, um, I think the low was recorded more like in October, but it didn't do a whole lot until it got past November. So I think the next month or so is this window where we could see the gold correction extend a little bit deeper, uh, but that then would set up another move going into next up move going into next year. So we're, it sounds like we're pretty much in agreement. It's just a question of, you know, the near term squiggles. Yeah. Hey, I don't pretend to know where it's going, but I do, I am convinced for a variety of reasons that it is going higher first and foremost is the stock market went up around the same time that gold was going up the dollar was going up same time as gold gold is always supposed to be the contrary or counter trade to the dollar when you see them both going up together you gotta you gotta take notice of that and then there's so many other things the breaking of the six-year sideways channel uh that was a big one. Yeah. That was a big thing. A lot you of, know, because any a lot junior tech, technical chart analyst could look and say, oh my goodness, that's a breakout, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, this, these days, money goes where the action is. Because of central bank easing, there is a fair amount of money floating around. Um, and when th- something starts to move, everyone's happy to jump on the, the bandwagon. And as you know, I believe at some point in time in the next few months, President Trump is going to start trying to talk the dollar down. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't think that's possible. But I remember 2014, Mario Draghi complaining about their inflation being too low, that the euro was too strong. And, uh, you know, it took a few months. But currency traders finally got the message that, oh, we can short the euro and we don't have to worry about any intervention or anything else. Mario wants it down. We'll help him. And I think the same thing could evolve over the next in coming months um, with Trump. And, it, and to me, it, it has to be Trump and Venetian um, yeah. to sound that, you know, the dollar is too strong. Uh, we think it should be lower. And I think currency traders will, you know, get the message and realize that they can sell the dollar short, go long other currencies, and they're not going to get surprised by any intervention or anything. So, that I think is coming and how that works with, you know, will work with gold railing. You know, I, I don't know. Again, for me, people sometimes think very logically, you know, higher rates mean the dollar should go up. Lower rates mean the dollar goes down. 
Well, the dollar went from 103 to 88 from uh, January of 2017 to February, March of 2018. The dollar lost 15 percent of its value and the Fed raised the Fed funds rate four times during that period of time. So um, they've been cutting rates. Dollar hasn't gone down. So this idea that, you know, rates in the dollar or any currency are really linked strongly, it makes a lot of logical sense. And it makes it easy for people to accept that. And I think the same thing holds true, Kerry, with, oh, if the dollar goes down, gold's supposed to go up. Yeah, sometimes you just noted that over the last you know, few months, the dollar was working its way higher and gold went up a lot. Yep. So there are no absolutes in some of these things. And that's why I think you have to almost look at each market individually and not rely on what appear to be logical connections, because a lot of times they just don't hold up over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really can't. And you know, that just like we say, the fourth quarter are usually very strong for precious metals uh, because of external factors, the Indian wedding season, foreigners tend to buy during that time. You know, it doesn't have to happen. Nothing written in blood that it's going to, but overall, I would say the odds are quite good, especially because you and I agree we're in a bull market, but the market always seeks to frustrate the majority of participants. The minute everybody starts thinking that this is written in stone, then you know the market's going to do something else. So interest rates, how much lower can they go? Can they go any lower, especially if they're not going to be cutting the Fed funds rate much lower? Uh that's an interesting question. I think we'll have to leave it for yeah. next time, though, Jim, because uh, we are Sounds good. We are out of time. So what do you think uh, interest rates, where do you think they're heading? Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Tell us what you think. Gold, precious metals, the dollar. We'd love to know your opinion. kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feed at kerrylutz. Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. I should ask you, Jim, to just tell us your website and how we uh, connect with you on the web. Uh, Jim Welsh uh, Macro uh, is dot uh, com, and they can also reach me at uh, Jim Welsh Macro at gmail dot right. com. And we should also mention that it's W E L S H, right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, otherwise they're going to say Welsh about grape juice and other yeah. things. You know, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, it is W E L S H. Thank you, yeah. Gary. Because otherwise they're going to send it to uh, Jim Walsh and. I think he's running for president yeah. or something, and he's a, yeah, yeah. No, no, we don't Joe want Walsh. that. That's Joe Walsh, and we're not talking <laughs> about the great guitar player. Oh uh, well, you could send to him, but I don't think he really is up on uh, precious metals prices. Uh, you know, he knows about Maseratis and licenses, but not too much about metals. So just remember, Jim Welsh, yeah. W E L S H, and Jim will answer your questions as well. Just send us an email. We love getting them. And we're, we're way behind right now because I was in Beaver Creek at the Precious Metal Summit, but we will catch up. Jim, thanks so much, as always, for coming on. We'll talk to you again real soon. Great to be with you, Kerry. Take care. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.